Hi, everybody. We're fortunate today, the subject of our discussion, which is going to be led by the gentleman beside me, is AI, deep learning, machine learning for eventually industrial application. Dr. Eli David, my partner, is a very renowned scientist, a professor in university and a lecturer, and a researcher, 50 papers, advisor for the Forbes uh, Technology Council, has been uh, giving direction and lectures for many uh, Fortune 500 companies with thousands of people that are coming internally from each company about the main subject of our discussion today. How do you actually do what you need to do in order to eventually make machines smart or make any digital or non-digital gadget think? Uh, Eli, please. Thank you very much, Yoav. Thank you very much for joining us. In the next half an hour, I hope to be able to give you an overview of what's happening in the AI world. Why is everyone so excited about AI? What are the developments? What we at the DeepCube division of NanoDimension have achieved and how we're using that AI technology for industrial applications. Let's start by an overview of artificial intelligence. Everyone speaks of AI. Every company claims they're doing AI. But actually, AI is a broad umbrella term. Anything that exhibits any kind of intelligence is artificial intelligence. For example, if you may remember IBM's Deep Blue that defeated Garry Kasparov in chess in 1997, it was just a giant chess calculator. No learning capabilities, but it was artificial intelligence. But today, when we say advanced AI, we refer to learning capabilities, autonomous learning capabilities. Now, within artificial intelligence, we have multiple subfields. One of them is a field called machine learning, where the machine learns by itself from the data, rather than just being explicitly programmed. Within machine learning, we have many different subfields based on different mathematical or statistical principles. One of those subfields is a field called neural networks, also known as deep neural networks or deep learning. So deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. Now, why is that important? All of these other fields, let's call them traditional machine learning, have major limitations that have hindered the development of advanced learning capabilities in the past few decades. The main problem is that traditional machine learning can never directly process raw data. Imagine, for example, you would like to perform face recognition, or in our case, industrial inspection during additive manufacturing. When you look at the raw data, what's raw data? It's an image, image full of pixels. In traditional machine learning, you can never process the raw data directly. Instead, you need human experts that tell you what are the most important features, the properties in that domain. For face recognition, the properties would be, let's say, distance between pupils, that's one feature. Distance between nose and a mouth, another feature. Texture, color, etc. We can think of a few tens of features. So the raw data is uh, convert it into a list of features which is then fed into the machine learning model. This is the same process wherever you apply machine learning. Computer vision, speech recognition, text understanding, everywhere. And this is the biggest limitation of traditional machine learning for two reasons. The first one is obvious. When I take a rich raw data, imagine a photo of uh, one scan of uh, during the printing time, millions of pixels or an image, or a medical image, millions of pixels. When you convert them to a small list of features, as good as they may be, you're throwing out most of the patterns, most of the information that is there. But this is not the biggest problem. The worst problem is that we, the human experts, are terrible at specifying features. Now, this sounds counterintuitive. Now, if we are an expert, then by definition, we should be able to tell what are the important features. So let's take an example and illustrate this point. I assume that all of you are world experts in detecting cats and dogs. If I give you a picture of a cat or a dog, in a few milliseconds, you will be able to say if it's a cat or a dog with 100% accuracy. I assume you agree with me. Now, try to think, what is the difference between a cat and a dog? Try to explain it to me. 
Anyone brave enough here to try that? Size. Size, that's a good feature. If we take that feature, we will correctly classify 70% of them. Most of the dogs are bigger than cats, but you get 80% accuracy, right? But you get to 100% accuracy. So you have some secrets that you're keeping them away from me. What are your secrets? How do you detect them? By sound. Sound, very good. In a photo, you still detect cat and dog? No. You do, without any right, sound. Without yeah. Well, so don't feel bad about yourself. For the past 15 years, every semester at the university, 100 students, I asked them this question. To this date, nobody has been able to tell me what's the difference between a cat and a dog. To be fair, the question I asked you was a very unfair question. We learn concepts, cat, dog, anything, by looking at the raw data. Our brain builds those concepts. Cat and dog are simple concepts. When I tell you, when I ask you, to explain to me what are those features, you can access only a small amount of those features. Your brain builds nonlinear models. When we explain, we mostly access only linear, simple patterns. So we cannot access that information. So I do trust that you can detect cats and dogs, but you're just not capable of explaining what are the features you're using. And if for the simplest task for our brain, we're having such grave difficulties, what are our chances for more challenging tasks like face recognition, speech recognition, language understanding, industrial inspection? They are a bit more challenging than detecting just cats and dogs. Now, deep learning, deep neural networks, which takes inspiration from how our own brains work, is the first and currently the only method we have in AI that can skip feature engineering. It directly operates on raw data. So when you're applying deep learning to uh, images, the pixels are fed directly into the input layer of the deep neural network. And through the deep hierarchy, it implicitly learns the nonlinear features, builds a model a bit similar to how our own brain works by looking at the data. Now, despite this breakthrough, neural networks are not a new topic. It was started in the 1970s. So why the excitement right now? For decades, we couldn't train, we could not train big neural nets for various mathematical and computational reasons. So over many years, we could train only small neural nets. This is the size of the neural net in terms of number of parameters in the brain, number of synapses in the brain. For many years, we could not build one. So in 1980s, there were some breakthroughs. We could train small neural nets. In 1990s, gradually they fell out of fashion. And in the 2000s, Many consider them a completely refuted field of study because of traditional machine learning obtained better results. Suddenly, in the 2010s, thanks to using GPUs, graphics processing units, advanced hardware, and series of algorithmic breakthroughs, we were capable of training larger and larger neural nets, millions of connections. And suddenly, almost overnight, we witnessed the greatest leap in performance in the history of AI in every field. Vision, speech, text, wherever they were applied, they revolutionized the data. Let me share with you in chronological order some of the breakthroughs we witnessed in the past decade. I think the example that struck everyone, and everyone saw that deep learning is something completely different, was this one. This is a benchmark called ImageNet. Up to a decade ago, it was considered the gold standard of computer vision the most challenging problem. A thousand categories, a million images, you have to say what you see in the image. You have five guesses, by the way. If you get one of them correct, you answer this. We humans are quite good. We obtain 5% error rate. Before deep learning, best traditional machine learning with traditional image processing, with all human expert involvement, we used to stand a 25% error rate. With deep learning, without image processing, without expert, just training the large amounts of data and feeding the pixels to the deep neural net, we stand at 3% error rate. Much better than humans. These are, by the way, the top five predictions of the deep learning model. Now, afterwards, we figured out that the same methods could be applied to language understanding. By the way, how do we train language models? It is always next word prediction. 
We tell it some of the sentence, it always tries to predict the next word. Now we have a language model, we have a computer vision model, we can co-train them so that they understand images and text. So the next benchmark that caught everyone by surprise was image explanation, image captioning. Given these images, these were the results provided by deep learning models. Construction worker in orange safety vest is working on road. Black and white dog jumps over bar. Again, these are deep learning models that don't know anything about image processing or English language. They've just been trained on a huge amount of images, language, and then together. Fast forward several years, up to the past two years, and suddenly we got to a point when we can give them the text so they generate the images. Now we've been playing with this for many years. At the beginning there were kind of terrible looking images. You, you tell it, give me a photo of a zebra. It gives you a zebra, some stripes, but it looks terrible. But we trained larger and larger neural nets. Now, when you give a text to a deep learning model, ask it to create an image, don't forget that it has trained on billions of images. There is always a suspicion that if I, for example, ask it, show me a photo of a small boy holding a red balloon. Maybe it has seen that photo somewhere and it's just copying it, giving it to me. There is no way for me to find out if it's cheating. So let's give it crazy text to see if it really creates new things. How about these crazy things? Vibrant portrait painting of Salvador Dali with a robotic half face. Espresso machine that makes coffee from human souls. Panda mad scientist mixing sparkling chemicals. It has never seen such things. These are the photos generated by deep learning model. Every single pixel on the screen is generated by deep neural network. It is not based on any image, not based on any template. It is text in, pixels, pixels out. Fast forward to the past three months. These are the kind of photos generated by deep learning. Every pixel here is generated by deep learning models for various text. So what happened in the past few months? All the excitement. I'll get to GPT. I'm sure you're waiting for that in a moment. Bigger and bigger neural nets. This graph is not the graph you saw a few minutes ago. This graph starts with a million parameter neural network. And the past few years and past decade, you see, even though this is a logarithmic chart, we are building larger and larger models. In the past year, we've crossed the point of models with tens of billions of parameters. Hundreds of billions we already have, and we expect in this year, 2023, to have the first models that have several hundred trillion parameters. Larger models, better results. Let's do another test, a bit more challenging than cat and dog. Some of the photos in this slide are artificial, generated by deep learning. And some of them are real. Take a moment, can you guess which one is real and which one is artificial? B and D. Are real? B and D? Artificial. B and D artificial, A and C real? Okay, any other guesses? All of them artificial. All of them artificial, okay. No, A has to be real. Right. A, you're sure that it is real? I would guess. Okay. I've been testing this on large crowds. I'm happy to tell you that our accuracy is very good, as good as flipping a coin. 50% accuracy, this is what we get. Reality and AI for generating images in, is indistinguishable. It has passed the Turing test. You're curious for the results? One last look. Let's start with the first one. Completely AI generated. This was the text given that created this image. Second one, also fake. This is the text given, generated that. Now, most people, in these two, it's 50-50. Most people say this one is fake and that's real because of the gravity and water droplets. This one is real, I captured it with my phone, no editing. It's just a small pond with some leaves over there, as real as it gets. And the last one, also fake. Beautiful kingfisher catching a fish. Cinematic lighting. You can even tell AI what kind of lighting. GPT, everyone's hearing about that, right? This was two weeks ago, the cover of Time magazine, Chat GPT. This is the first model that has over 100 billion parameters. Large models, trained on huge amount of data. 
And the results are frankly mind-boggling. If you haven't played with ChatGPT, stop watching me. Go play with ChatGPT. It's much more interesting. Just give you one example there. That if somebody told me two years ago that machine can solve this, I would say it's crazy. Michael is at that really famous museum in France looking at the most famous painting. The artist who made this painting just makes Michael think of this favorite cartoon character from his childhood. What was the country of origin of the thing that the cartoon character usually holds in his hand? How much knowledge do you need to solve this? You ask it to chat GPT, easily replies, the famous museum is Louvre. He's looking at Mona Lisa. It's painted by Leonardo da Vinci. The character from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is Leonardo, which is holding those double swords, ninjatos, and those double swords are made in Japan. So the answer is Japan. Easily solves that. I can share with you tens of even crazier examples, but for me, the best example that I had an epiphany, I understood that this is true intelligence, was actually this example. So we ask it, how much is 2 plus 5? It says 2 plus 5 is 7. And then we ask it, my wife says it's 8. He says, well, 2 plus 5 is actually 7, not 8. It could be that your wife has made a mistake or misunderstood the problem. So I wrote, my wife is always right. And it replied, I apologize. I must have made an error. If your wife says it's eight, then it must be eight. This is true intelligence. <laughs> now, everything I told you so far, it may sound too good to be true, and actually it is. I didn't tell you the, the unpleasant part of deep learning, that it is not a genie that comes out of the bottle and just, you make a wish, it makes it happen. There are huge barriers of entry for deep learning deployment in real world. There is computation cost. As an example, it is estimated that just the training of that language model took more than 10,000 GPUs. Imagine the cost. Computation cost is relevant not just for training, but for deployment. Even more critical point, I will address it in a moment. There is scarcity of experts. All the big companies are competing over these experts. It is very difficult to be, build a large deep learning team of scientists and developers. Models are becoming more and more complex. It's no longer the small neural nets 1980s, 1990s. Extremely complex. Now I have master's PhD students. Each one of them are working in a specific subfield here. And the most important problem, they're challenging to deploy. It is one thing to do deep learning research and another thing to deploy it because of computational uh, constraints and edge computing. This is the most relevant constraint for industrial applications. You can train the deep learning model, you put it on the cloud, and it's good enough if you are Google or Microsoft or OpenAI. But now imagine you would like to put that AI to work on edge devices. Edge devices could be anything from automotive and smartwatch or drones or the industrial machines for different tasks, for manufacturing, for additive manufacturing, for every task that has a machine that AI needs to reside there. Now imagine, let me get ahead of myself here, in nano dimension. Our printers are already powered by artificial intelligence. Can you imagine that while we are printing, we do one print, we take a photo, we take the printing task, we tell it, wait for a moment, we're uploading the photo to the cloud. Photo goes to the cloud, AI is done, and the result comes back. That's crazy. That's not practical. And this is just one example for why application of deep learning is so challenging. And this is exactly what the DeepCube division has done. We are a team of uh, 30 deep learning researchers and developers. They're usually people who are good at real world applications and researcher. It's very rare to find groups of people that are exactly at that intersection of research and deployment. And that is most of DeepCube. We've developed a proprietary framework for efficient deployment of AI for real world application, not for research. Many great people are doing their research. Our work is on applications of deep learning and how you would bring them on edge devices and specifically on industrial machines. 
over 45 uh, filed patents out of which 20 granted. I will share with you just a few of them that gives us a very wide moat around what we do. Not only we are the leaders in what we are doing, but we do have a large moat around us. So, uh, and the team here from various different backgrounds, from vision, from speech, from unsupervised learning, from anomaly detection, all these skills are relevant for industrial applications. So, if I address this and say these are some of the challenges, computation, memory requirements, gigabytes of memory, not, you would like to reduce that to shrink that, this is what DeepCube does, focusing on improving those areas. We have, as I said, 45 patents, each one of them different technology, 20 granted. Let me share with you just one of those patents, because if I talk about all of them, these guys have to sit here for several hours instead of the half an hour. All deep learning, everything, those producing images, the chat GPT, every deep learning model is based on artificial neurons connected to each other. These are the parameters. These are essentially dense matrices, matrix. So you multiply matrices and you get the result. One of our groundbreaking technologies at DeepQ, which we have a very broad patent on, is we have a unique method of training neural nets to achieve nearly the same accuracy as the baseline, but making them very sparse, removing a big portion of the connections. Now think about it. You remove the connections, the model becomes smaller in size, and then it needs less computation when you run it. The computation and memory of neural nets are in direct correlation to the number of parameters. So it's like magic. You can remove many of the synapses, the connections, and the accuracy remains high. Now this is one set of patterns that we have, but that in itself doesn't solve a problem. So if, let's look under the hood, if these numbers are the numbers of the connections, in the baseline, you have all those numbers. Now with DeepCube technology, you made the sparse that is, you made all of them, turn them into zeros. Take this and run it with standard deep learning frameworks, you get no speed up and no memory reduction because all those zeros are still there in memory and part of computation. So in DeepCube we developed an entire deep learning framework for deployment that essentially removes zeros and performs sparse inference. Essentially, our framework does sparse inference, it can optimize itself for any hardware for example, here we're optimizing it for our own hardware uh, within uh, Nano Dimension in Dragonfly family. It is operating system agnostic and the bottom line, which is the most important, dramatic speed and memory improvement. This allows us to take these large neural networks and instead of cloud, put them on the devices themselves and run them. Now, the technology that we have, the core technology, has many applications for any industry that needs edge deployment. Even things beyond industrial, like uh, drones, autonomous vehicles, smartphones, etc. But that is not our focus, even if the technology is relevant. Our focus for the past two years has been the core application of this framework for industrials. Our goal was to be the best AI framework for industrial applications. Now, there are specific challenges for applying deep learning to industrials. Varying data types. It is not standard vision that you have different kind of cameras more or less the same. Different sensors, each, each one of them produce different types of data, different frequencies of data. You have lots of unlabeled data. What is labeled and unlabeled? Labeled is a data that comes with some label. This is an image, it's a cat. This is an image of a scan, this is a malfunction. You have lots of data from machines that don't have associated labels. You need to do anomaly detection on them, unsupervised learning. With it, you need to do customized training for each one of those configurations. And finally, again, the most important part, after you do all of that, you need to do real-time deployment on the device. And this is what the DeepCube framework does. We've optimized it, the same core technology that I shared with you, we optimize it for industrial use cases to support various data types, both supervised and unsupervised learning, and power-efficient real-time deployment. What have we done with the development of this technology so far? First of all, we have and are working on empowering all our machines within the extended nano-dimension ecosystem with this framework. We're working 
within the, with the Dragonfly for industrial inspection. In real time, during printing process, we'll look at that. With SM Tech for pick and place, we are working together with them to apply the technology there for print quality optimization. For example, during printing time, sometimes the nozzle are not aligned. Usually this required human intervention, manual inspection. Now deep learning looks at that in real time and sees that something is not working properly. With GIS in the printing process, process optimization within the, now that I mentioned, with third parties and for monitoring and maintenance of the machines, not just the specific tasks that we're doing. So essentially, that core AI technology that we had that was optimized for real-time deployment, in the past two years we've optimized it for industrial deployment, for any data type, for any kind of application. We started by deploying it internally, and now we're also facing outward, uh, starting discussions with companies that are external to NanoDimension that can benefit from our technology, which we believe is one of the leading technologies in the world for bringing AI to the industrial world. I hope you enjoyed this overview. Thank you so much. <laughs>